Welcome back to Seek Strength and welcome back to Seek Ascend. Today we're looking at some of the best squatters in the world. Now you might be like, oh, that's arbitrary. Yeah, well, anyway, here's first up, we've got Tian Tao, one of my favorite all-time squatters. And here, first video, he's squatting 320 kilos. This was when he was in 96. Now, as far as I know, Tian Tao didn't compete that overweight when he was in the 90s. So it's feasible he's under 100 kilo body weight here, which is freaky. Absolutely. My favourite thing about Tan Tao is just how well built he is in terms of torso length to leg length for squatting. Yes. I don't think you could make somebody in a lab better than Tan Tao. Well, there's an argument against that long back and low hips, you know, so there's some very good benefits to that. So you've got low hips to the ground, so you once you hit a full depth squat, you've still got a smaller range of motion than someone who would have a tiny torso and long legs. But then the long back is obviously much harder to maintain strength throughout and he has zero issue in this 320 kilo back squat high bar just ass to the grass what are some of the things you like about his squat there the the other thing i really love about his squat is just how well nailed in that form is he does a little wink to get a little bit of a whip in the bar before he does each one we're watching videos over the course of six or seven years here and every squat is absolutely identical. This set right here is a 300 kilos for a set of four. How many people can you think <laughs> of that aren't super heavies that can do 300 kilos for a set of four in a high bar squat? How many? Not many. None. None. He's the only person None. I can think of. Akbar Jurayev <laughs> and Mar Simone Marcerossian probably. Like if you take super heavies out of that. Yes. How many? How many people alive can high bar squat 300 kilos with abs or at least are not fluffy, you know? Not grossly overweight. It's crazy. Do we know what height Tan Tao is, roughly? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Here's a 310 kilo back squat. Now, there's a couple of things I love about Tan Tao squat, and you'll see in the rest of the people on this list. But one of them is very, very consistent, is that even though he does have that long back, he's got a super strong back. So like Dara talked about there, he maintains that position incredibly consistently. And one of the things I think really helps him with maintenance of that upper back position, so that was a 310 kilo squat, but here's 270 where we can really see his back for a set of six, is that Tantau's wrist position is super stacked. So that doesn't mean a vertical elbow position straight under the barbell. That elbow, in this case, for example, is about 45 degrees if you looked at it from the side, but his forearm, wrist, elbow are all in a relatively straight line. So it's obviously not going to be perfectly straight, but it's closer to how you might punch with a fist. And this maintenance of that back position. So when we see a lot of that flaring, when we raise up those elbows and we extend their wrist a lot, we end up with a lot of upper back rounding or the possibility of a lot of upper back rounding. It's something I do personally and I hate it. And it's a terrible <laughs> habit. And it's something I need to get rid of. But he's a fantastic example of someone who maintains that stacked wrist position. And it's so important for the high bar squat. Yeah, I think there's a, a schema of things that tend to happen when we see people failing squats due to their upper back rounding. The first thing is we tend to see the, the hands opening and the wrist kind of slipping forward. The second thing we see is a complete like break of the wrists and the elbows following through. And then the last thing we tend to see is the shoulders kind of opening up because of that. He has none of that happening. What I really like as well about his squat is, you know, a lot of times when people think of high bar Olympic squats, sometimes we think of super narrow, knees as far as forward as possible, kind of reducing the range of motion almost. But Tian Tao is outside hip width. Tian Tao almost outside shoulder width stance, toes pointed out, and he's giving his squat plenty of room to sit in between his heels. So he's letting those hips do their job. And he's not the most upright in the start position. So he's not someone who is as upright as possible, maintaining as vertical a torso as possible. He is maintaining a consistent torso angle, but he's slightly actually inclined when he starts all his reps. So here's a lovely little HD 290. Yeah, it's an interesting position. A lot of people who are looking for the more vertical, more ass to grass, more high bar position, do just what Gurf was talking about. They basically stack their shoulders straight over the top of their hips and they try and stay there as much as you can. If you look at Tan, you see that small forward lean and then the extension of the upper back, which brings the bar or maintains the bar over the midfoot. But it's important that you're not constantly trying for that kind of uh, shoulders over hips position. This does lead to those hips drifting forward a bit too much and you not being able to use your posterior chain at all and basically just doing a front squat with it. Yeah, sometimes you might see if that if you don't have the particular hip structure, foot stance, 
bar position to be super upright. So you'll see Tanto, it's it's ever so slightly, those hips just start a little bit behind. But if you don't particularly have that, what you might see, if you do have the flexibility, but not the anatomy, you might see a lot of that lower back flexion in the bottom of the squat, which could lead to a lax in the upper back position, moving forward of the upper back, moving forward of the barbell, outside of that kind of mid-foot position when you're on the bottom, and which would lead to not great quality squats in terms of consistency. I think we should probably talk about it now as that video of him sitting in front of the mirror pops up. But Tan is like the other squatters in today's video where they have an exceptional amount of back musculature. You Like their lats are massive, their erector spinae are massive, their lower traps and upper traps are massive. And you can't get away from that. A lot, a lot of people when they start wanting to squat a bit deeper or a bit more upright or more high bar for want of a better term... They start thinking about less in terms of muscle development and more in terms of these kind of long pauses in the bottom. They'll think about pulling the weights back. They'll think about pulling the volume back. You should look at the kind of trail of crumbs that the success leaves here. Tan has an absolute bussy. He's yacked in his back. He has got a back. P word. You can't say that. Because they've gotten really, the algorithm, the AI is picking up hard on those words. (laughs) They pick up on everything. Next, we've got another high bar squatter and absolutely, objectively, one of the best squatters ever, not only in the world right now, but John Hack, who typically competes as an 89 or a 90 kilo lifter and typically squats in the range of 350 to 360 in competition. He's notorious for a high bar squat and there's a lot of great points on John's squat. Again, first off, that wrist position. Now, he actually has that vertical wrist position underneath the barbell. That is, of course, due to the fact that John is a freak of nature and his back is redonkulous. You know, he's deadlifting in excess of 400 kilos conventional, so he has a little bit more of that leeway. For most of us, if we stack those wrists underneath our elbows, if we get that vertical back, we're opening up that back musculature a little bit too much. And if you have a 400 kilo conventional deadlift, do you? I don't, no. I don't either. So for most people, that'll expose that upper back musculature and you'll end up with a, a rounding of the upper back and then a hinging forward because the weight is going to drag you forward a little bit. My favourite thing about John's squat is just how much it focuses on leg development. So we have a lot of forward knee travel. We have a quite, like compared to other powerlifters, a very narrow stance. He's just outside hip width. His toes are pointed pretty much straight forward and he really does focus on the the amount of leg development he can get out of his squat. It's interesting, in many ways, John's squat is developed as a weightlifter squat. It's the super upright torso, narrower stance than many powerlifters, more of an anterior dominance rather than a posterior dominance, and it's clearly working for him. Well, he is just about to squat 350 kilos here. The only thing wrong with this is that he's using a 25 kilo barbell, which everybody knows for mental math is incorrect, and that's not uh, that's not right. It's actually harder than calculating the weight on a 15 kilo female there. Yeah, it's actually worse. So we got a 350 kilo squat. He's got his beanie on, and the high bar squats. Again, you'll notice as well with his foot position, can't quite see it here, but you'll see it on a different video in a second, is that the toe position is relatively straightforward because he's looking for that max amount of forward knee travel. So any amount of excess rearward hip travel, we're going to end up with the opposite end of the lever, your back tilting forward, the weight drags you forward, and of course you're not going to be able to resist those forces to stay upright. And John Hack is someone who is lifting weights where any technical inefficiency is really going to punish him. And you can see he actually almost has a little bit of upper back rounding or it would appear that way, but in fact it just looks like it's a huge amount of upper back muscles. It just looks so strange. So where John's bar sits on his back, like if you're looking at it, particularly from behind, like a 45 degree angle, a lot of time when you're looking at it, it looks like it's incredibly high on his neck. And then you look at it from the front and it's sitting just above that acromion process on the shoulder. It's not very high. It's just the thickness of muscle in his like upper trap. The thickness of muscle moves the bar so much away from his back that it looks like it's very high. Another very important part with the upper body, which is super important in squatting, is that not only seeing that kind of vertical position, but they maintain really rigid throughout the whole lift. So like I was talking about, you don't see the wrist breaking or the elbow breaking or forward or backwards. We don't see his hands opening, fingertip grip happening, even though he starts off with a full fist. You'll see that it just maintains 
consistency and the same position throughout the whole squat, which is very, very important. So one of the most important parts of the upper body during the squat is that it doesn't matter particularly what angle you start with if it makes sense for you it's that you don't change your angle of the back massively now some tolerance is fine but when we're looking for maximum technical proficiency a consistent back angle throughout the squat is more important to a certain degree than a perfectly upright back if you are accounting for your leverages and your mobility and some of your strengths and weaknesses. So finding the right angle at the start, like we talked about Tan Tao, and keeping it there is so important. So there's no point starting super upright and then immediately hinging forward. The final thing I think you should look at with John's squat is just the level of control with all of the movement throughout the squats. There's no extraneous movement of driving the elbows up behind. There's no weird movement of the head that kind of pigeon necking forward. There's no strange winking in or valgus rotation of the knees. Everything about it is just very, very controlled. I know on some of the sets here, you'll see on the way down on the first rep, there might be some shaking of the knees. That's not so much a concern. But when we start seeing people and they have a lot of extra movement going on, maybe they're breathing in and their shoulders are coming up. Maybe they're taking a massive breath to their upper chest and they have a lot of bar movement or head movement going on. All of that stuff bleeds a small bit of power, whether it bleeds it through excessive fatigue over the course of multiple sets and reps, or whether it bleeds it through lack of stability. All of that is a negative, and John has almost none of it. But he has got a lot of booby mass. <laughs> now, next up, we have got an unexpected one for you, but it is Teenage Clarence has probably one of the most aesthetic squats I can think of one of my favorite squats and this is something Clarence himself has talked about if you watch some of the Japan videos that this is a style of squat he thought was his best squat form and it was one he's slowly making his way back to if you're following his training at the moment and there's a lot of great points in this that line up with the other aspects we we're talking about with Tan Tao and John Hack but one of the things that's pretty amazing about Clarence's squat and it's almost an anomaly to Clarence's squat but it does bear talking about it because it's so cool, is that most of the time you'll see when Clarence is squatting, he squats down, here's a great angle from the side, he's pushing those knees forward like we want, maximum use of the knee extensors for the Olympic style lifting, and pushing these forward, push them up out of the squat as he's doing well, and then as he gets slowly more fatigued, like normal, we see a little bit more of a rearward movement of the knees, or the shin angle getting more perpendicular slightly earlier, what would happen for most people is we would see that upper back rounding like we talked about, but in Clarence's case, he moves himself into more upper back extension or forces that upper back extension even though he shifts his hips back, which keeps the barbell over his midfoot, and so he essentially still is keeping that barbell tracking relatively straight. So the best bar pad isn't necessarily straight in the squat, but it does stay inside that window, which is more or less over the midfoot for want of simplifying it down and finding a concise way of talking about it so the fact that Clarence is able to do that is testament to his innate ability to find a good way of squatting but also how strong his back is to do that yeah absolutely most of us when those knees shift back and the hips shift back because that lever suddenly becomes a bit more perpendicular we have obviously much more leverage of the bar pushing us down and that rounding over happens Clarence is just insanely strong mm -hmm. this is I'll go on record as saying these two years of squats from Clarence are my favorite squats on the internet. Oh, 100%. Yeah, absolutely. They're more athletic, more dynamic. Certainly, there are people who've squatted more weight. Certainly, there's people who have been lighter and squatted heavier weights. But in my opinion, these are the best squats that have ever been recorded. The next thing I think it's worth talking about for Clarence, and a lot of us could do it a bit more of this, is how intentional he is on the way down the squat. You'll have seen it in Tyan's squat and in John Hack's squat. They're both very, very conservative on the way down. It's not that they're sitting down incredibly slowly, but they're not really utilizing all of that uh, stretch shortening cycle at the bottom of the squat. I love how much Clarence uses it here. Now, obviously, there's a load of memes about Clarence dive bombing squats and about his knees exploding and all that. All that aside, I love how much intention he puts into the speed on the way down and the aggression that he hits the bottom position with. So another aspect as well of the straight wrist position is that it allows him to maintain that upper back position that he's going for when he has some 
potential for technical degradation. So if you're to watch my squats, for example, where Clarence shifts his hips back slightly but puts his back into more extension, one of my issues is that my upper back rounds a little bit more and then my tendency is rather than sending my hips back and extending my upper back into a better position or trying to keep it in that good position is that my hips will come underneath the barbell and will get a bit of that upper back rounding position, will get a breaking of the wrists, get more extension of those wrists, maybe a loosening of the grip, which is not ideal because when we really reduce our ability to power through with our legs and maintain our back in a good position. So you can see even here, when he fails on this repetition, he doesn't really compromise any position. So this is almost a maximal technical failure if you looked at this rep or a muscular failure, but the technique doesn't fail, I should say, and it's literally, he can't do any more squats at this weight, and it's a testament to him maintaining that position as much as possible. There's a great example here of 210 kilos for a set of 10. Clarence is about 88 kilos in this video, and you'll see that those technical degradations, or those technical compensations, he gets more fatigued. Degradation makes it sound like it's bad, but the initial reps you'll see are, you know, fantastic examples of that ideal squat almost. Yeah, I think with the rounding forward or people stopping rounding forward, it definitely is a bit of a mental thing or a mental decision you have to make before you start squatting. So a lot of us would have gotten to that point in Clarence's squat, you're 80% or 90% the way through the rep. Most of us there will round forward a small bit, we'll shift the weight onto our back a bit more and we'll just grind through it. I'm certainly more guilty of this than anyone else. When you're looking for that kind of technical perfection, when you're looking for the real creme de la creme of ass to grass, high bar squatting, you have to have made that decision in your head that no matter what, there's going to be no degradation of form like Owen talked about. Those positions and those mechanics are going to be maintained. And if you're 95 percent weight through a rep and you decide, oh, I actually can't push anymore or the barbell stops moving, then you're just going to sit down into the bottom of the squat and bail it like Clarence. That is difficult for many athletes to do, especially when you're towards the pointy end of the training season or training block, when you've maybe peaked, maybe you're testing a 1RM, maybe you're testing a 3RM or a 5RM. Those carrots that are dangled out in front of us are so, so tempting. But if you do want that kind of technical mastery, if you want a very, very nice high bar ass to grass squat, you have to be willing to just lob it off when you need to and not grind through. What I think as well is a great example of these is that a lot of the people will look at Clarence's kind of latter day squats or maybe some of the pause squats and use those as an excuse like we saw from some of the videos from Japan in the comments was that they'll use those as an excuse to compensate poorly for a squat, a squat that they like doing themselves or that they enjoy watching from Clarence. But unfortunately, it's not the best style of squat, not for them or really not for anyone. It doesn't make sense in terms of the actual physics of the barbell and the lifter. And people use Clarence's builds as an example of why he can't squat the high bar, upright, knees forward way. But in fact, his build didn't change from here to a couple of years later. He is the same person. And you'll see that the reason he wasn't able to squat the way he normally would is because of knee pain. And subsequently, he said he had hip pain squatting a certain side at the moment. That doesn't mean... That, that he shouldn't squat like that, it means that they cause an issues. The knee pain is probably from load. The hip pain is probably a combination of load and a technical issue. But it's not an example of, oh, you know, I can squat like this because I'm built like that. It's a, you know, there is optimal ways of squatting with technical changes in form, which are certainly valuable. And if we can figure those out the best ones for ourselves, it does make for a great quality squat, a good consistent squat, good maxes. And technical proficiency is something that you should always be striving for. And we're huge fans of it. That doesn't mean you don't train hard. Sometimes when people talk about technical proficiency and they say all the style of technique you use at heavy weights is how you should actually squat, which is, I think is a terrible take. Uh, you have technical inefficiencies that are exposed at heavy weights and you work to fix them because then when you revisit those weights, you have better technique, allows you to get more out of your body so you can squat heavier weight. If, of course, you want to get stronger, uh, if you still want to stay shit, then you can use your <laughs> technical inefficiencies. The last thing I'd say, and this goes out to everybody, is that all three athletes in this video have very, very different body shapes, 
uh, morphological characteristics, very different leg length. So uh, tibial length to femur length is incredibly important. Femur length to torso length is probably the most important. And with the upper back stuff, our ulnar or radial length compared to our humerus length is really important in terms of where we grip the bear. All these athletes are really different, yet all of them manage to massively improve over their years of training and they manage to have a form and a style of squatting that's incredibly effective and very aesthetically pleasing as well. So even if you are one of the long-legged, short, torsoed people out there like myself, there is hope for you. You just got to keep forcing it, keep training, more volume, more strictness, and you'll be good. Here's actually a great example of that technique even after the knee injuries, I believe. Yeah, so I think this has been something after the injuries when he's in the 90 kilo body weight range. You can still see ladder reps pushing over the knees over the toes lots of quad drive as reps go on then more upper back extension no change in that wrist angle just really squeezing onto that barbell that's another aspect as well of just holding that barbell tightly does allow you that extra mind muscle connection with your upper back musculature just to maintain all of that as much as possible you know there's the squat is a relatively simple movement squatting heavyweights well is a totally different beast you know the squatting mechanic Super fast to learn. You can teach anyone with a barbell to squat if they have the minimum requisite mobility to squat good. But if you want to squat heavy weights good, you need a lot of time and effort spent with that barbell. So if you enjoy squatting heavy weights and you want to get squatter, if you maybe are a weak squatter right now, head over to the Seeker Strength app on iOS and Android. We have the RTA1, which is a wildly successful program, which literally thousands of lifters have ran. And we've had PBs ranging from 5, 10 kilo PBs. The average is about 25 kilos per run. We've had PBs as big as 45 kilos. And this isn't someone who was going from 80 to 100. We've had people in the 150 range get to that 200 range. We've had plenty of people go from like 220 to 230 to 240 after the run. Many people get at least three runs out of the program. We've also developed the RTA 2.0, which is on the app. This is longer. This is primarily driven by people in mind who want to squat a little bit less intensely over a short period of time. Also for people who've ran the RTA already who need to move on to the next stage. Let's say you've milked that RTA drive from the first three or four runs. You move on to the RTA part 2.0. Or if you're someone who can't quite go as intense in those eight weeks, which was the original idea of the RTA, you move over to the RTA 2.0 and you... Still tough, but there's more volume, but it is a little bit smoother 12 weeks. Seek strength app, Android, iOS.